Good afternoon. Welcome to the opening session of the third annual symposium on Indian concerns at Iowa State. I'm Quentin Johnson of the English Department here, member of the planning committee for the program this year. I first met our speaker this afternoon. I met him about two years ago. I think it was almost two years ago this week at the uh, college conference on composition and communication down in New Orleans. And it was a most moving experience for me to hear Arthur Raymond discuss the very complex relations between education and culture and family for Indian people as he chaired the session on Indian literature and culture. Arthur Raymond comes to us uh, today with a uh, very broad, very deep experience in many directions. He is a member of so many organizations that I would not care to take of his time in, in mentioning the services that he has uh, provided for his community and for the nation and organizations. Presently, he is a member of the North Dakota legislature. He just got out of uh, session up there and he's about to return. He will return just after his presentation this afternoon to the University of North Dakota at Grand Forks where he is Director of American Indian Studies because the University of North Dakota is having its American Indian Concerns Week and so I think it was particularly generous of him to uh, come down here and br break away from that when he has to go back uh, so shortly but uh, the importance of the program there to him I'm sure is, is very large. Uh, he will speak on our topic. Uh, we're reminded in our program the admonition of lame deer that we must all consider ourselves, we must all see ourselves as a part of the land. Uh, he will be able to talk to us on this matter from the perspective of uh, an economist in his education as economist at Dakota Wesleyan, his experience as a journalist, practicing journalist, uh, managing editor of uh, newspaper, uh, Lewiston, North Dakota paper, I believe, has worked editing a uh, newspaper in, uh, in Grand Forks. His uh, service to community associations, uh, hospital associations, education associations, uh, youth program associations, his work in journalism, uh, from the point of view of his work in, his, in the Episcopal Church, and the Boy Scouts, a wide, wide range of, of social concerns and social activities. And uh, I think mo most important of all, he will matter of the Indian humanist perspective on the land. I think from the, that most important point of view to us in this program today, the perspective of Indian people. It's a very great pleasure, Arthur Raymond, that I ask you to open this session. these things here bother me a little bit. <laughs> Once upon a time I used to play professional baseball and I found that when I was nervous before a, a game it was a good sign because when I was a little bit nervous before that game it indicated to me that I was would be rather sharp that day and on my toes. But if I wasn't nervous, that was a bad sign because then I would be flat and dull and the, the fastball wouldn't hop. And, and so maybe it's a good sign today that I am a little bit nervous. I don't know. But anyhow, in order to put me at ease, I would like to tell you a story, a true story about myself. I often use this story because it's the only one I know, really. I have no others to tell. <laughs> and so because I can tell it with ease, it, it helps to put me at ease. And that's the purpose for it, after all. I grew up in the southern part of South Dakota on the Rosebud Reservation. 
And when I was a little kid, we lived some two and a half miles from the nearest little town where my brothers and sisters attended school. Before I was old enough to go to school myself, I begged my mother for several weeks and months to let me visit school. So finally, one cold winter day, she gave her consent. And I was boosted up on the back of Old Rainbow. And Old Rainbow and I bounced that two and a half miles to school. When Rainbow came up, I came down. And so we went this way all the way. By the time we got there, I was a little bit tender, you know, right back here. But I had a great time in school that day. In fact, I remember it even to this day. But I remember it, the, the trip home even more. That has been the longest two and a half mile trip I've ever made in my life from that day to this. Because what was tender in the morning became sore at night as Rainbow and I bounced home. So when I got home, I sneaked into the house and I went back into the kitchen and I went back behind the stove and I stood there because I didn't dare sit down. During the day, my mother had made soft, brown, delicious chocolate fudge as only my mother could make it. And so hearing from my older brothers and sisters what had happened to me, she came into the kitchen with a piece of this in her hand and she said, here son, this will make it feel better. So I took the fudge, I went back behind the stove, I took down my overalls and I applied it where it do the most good. <laughs> Did I tell it right? <laughs> well, I had just discovered something. I had just discovered a new Indian medicine because it works. <laughs> From that beginning there in South Dakota, I remember how the old ones used to gather in the evenings and tell the old stories. And among my very earliest recollections were the times when I used to sneak into these gatherings and listen to them tell the old stories. I believed these stories. I believed them implicitly and explicitly. This was the truth. I really didn't know what a valuable thing I was receiving because I wasn't old enough to write it down and make a permanent record of it. But nevertheless, those truths were etched on my mind for all time. And even to this day, I can hear and now see and hear in my mind's eye and ear the, the words and the voices of the old ones as they talked and told those stories. And finally, it became my turn, and I, st I started to go to school. And when one gets to be old enough where you start reading the history books, I too read those history books. I read them avidly because of the stories I'd heard. And I recognized the, the, the dates and the names and the places. And from there, there on out, all resemblance ended because they were totally unlike. And so I would go home to my mother, and I would say, say to her, what is this? What is this all about? And she would say, my son, that is white man's history. That is white man's history. So you see, I soon learned one thing, one very important thing, that there are two kinds of history. One written for the white man that you read in the history books, and another one that is for us, that belongs to us. The verbal tradition, the tradition that is written in the winter counts, in that circle. You'll, you'll notice when the, the uh, um, I was introduced up here, we came up this way. He suggested that we go around this way. And I said, no, no, let's go around this way. Because you see, the sacred circle moves in this direction like this, clockwise. And, and, and that in indicates accord, harmony, health, happiness. Your children are growing and well, and you love them. A and to go around counterclockwise is to indicate just exactly the opposite. Discord, disharmony, and all of these things. These were the kinds of things I learned as a little child. And, and then I began to read the history books, and I began to read where we were heathens and savages, and, and we scalped people, and we didn't know what it was all about because we, were, we did not know the Christian way. Let me ask you, who were the Christians? Let's have a look at that and see who really was. Th that person who believed in the great, the great spirit, the great spirit that is in everything, everywhere, for all time. Do you know, for example, 
that it was George Washington who said, they must not be simply overrun, they must be destroyed. The father of the United States of America, did you know that it was Jay Willard who signed the executive order on November 2nd of 1774, setting the bounty on the scalps of my people at 40 pounds sterling for the old ones and 20 pounds sterling for the little kids. And my people didn't even know how to scalp. That isn't something they did nor practice. That practice of scalping was brought over here by the Europeans. And finally, when our people learned how to retaliate by scalping in return, the history books had the audacity to call us heathens. Who was a heathen? I ask you. Because you see, our religion, our religion was a part of our everyday way of life. It wasn't something that we practiced on one hour on a Sunday and for the rest of the week for, forgot about it entirely. But it was so interwoven with our everyday way of life that it could not be extricated from, from our culture, from our value system, from our economy, or our social order. Let me see if I can give you some examples. You know, they tell that in what is called the golden age of our people, prior to April 29th, 1868, that ours was a great people. They stood tall and proud and strong and mighty. And one has to ask, where did this come from? Which came first, we've got to ask. We've got to ask, was it the value system? Was it the culture? Was it the religion? And we cannot answer. Because, you see, they are not separable or divorceable. They were all interwoven into one scheme that formed a fabric and a pattern that gave essence to our lives. Today, there is much talk going around about, and has been for the past six or seven years, about what is called the women's liberation movement. Did you know that our women voted for hundreds of years before this country ever heard of Carrie Nation in 1919? Did you know that our youth voted, boys and girls, when they had proven themselves ready and did not have to wait until some magical or arbitrary date of 21 or 19 or 18 or whatever. But this could be as young as 14 or 24. You see, it depended upon the person. And why then does it depend upon the person? Because you see, the Great Spirit exists in you and in me. The Great Spirit exists in everything there is to say less is to deny the infinity of that whom you call God. And if this is what you wish to do, that is fine. But to deny that infinity is to deny there is a great spirit. And so the great spirit exists everywhere, in everything. He exists here in this table, in the chairs you're sitting on in the watches you have on your wrists, in the glasses you wear, because he gave man the mentality in his mind and the talents in his hands to take the materials of this earth and make those tables and those watches and those chairs and the cars you drive. The Great Spirit is everywhere and in everything. The Great Spirit exists in the land and in the trees and in everything that walks, crawls, swims, or flies. <coughs> and the Great Spirit exists in that little one and in that old one. 
The great spirit exists in that little one, and that little one is complete from the time he is born. We will not get into an argument about <coughs> baptism because, you see, our people believed that it was not necessary to have to baptize a child to bring the grace of God into that new little newborn child or the adult who was being baptized because the Great Spirit already exists in that child. And so it was that we couldn't understand <coughs> when the Europeans first started pushing westward out here in the Plains area why I almost said your grandfathers, but why these people beat their children and we ask in wonderment and awe, don't you love them? Don't you care for them? Don't you see what they are going to do for you? Because it is in our children that lies the hope of the future. And it's the old ones who have given us what we have. So time, you see, is for the present. Time is for the present because we live in the here and the now. And so it is that you cannot slice up this infinity. And if the, the infinite exists in the land, then the land itself <coughs> is infinite. And how can you slice up a piece of infinity? It's like trying to take a huge dagger and chopping into the ocean and trying to cut water. It can't be done. It can only be done when that water turns into ice and no life exists. Then you can cut water. But there is life in the land, and it cannot be cut and sliced up. It is infinite and holy, and it will continue that way forever. So you see, there is no one person who could own a piece of the land. We couldn't cut it up and put it in little rectangulars or squares or, or triangles <coughs> or plots or lots or whatever and say, I own that, that is mine, and you can't use it. Because you see, the greatest gift of all that the Great Spirit gave to you and to me is the gift of sharing. And if you want to honor in our religion, you want to honor a person, you, the greatest gift you can give is of self, is of sharing of self. And the second greatest gift you can give is to share of things, material things. And so it is when you share of self, you honor the great spirit and you honor that person with whom you share. <coughs> if you give to somebody, you honor that person to whom you give. And it was often said of our culture and our society and our way of life that we were communal. This was a, was a polite way of saying we were communists. We were not communists. We were not communal just because we lived together. When I owned a horse, that was my horse. When I owned a teepee, that was my teepee. You see, I can't give you something that is not mine. I've got to own it first before I can give it away, before I can share it. So that, that's, that's the difference because those ignorant, abysmally ignorant writers came out here and failed to understand our way of life and to know our people. They said we were communists. It's simply untrue. Another one of those myths that is perpetuated in the history books which are so wrong even to this day. And that's one of the big jobs we have before us is to correct those history books, to make them right, to tell the story as it was, as it was and now is. And so, you see, the land and the sharing all came together within a person and within a being. And so when we sh shared with somebody, we honored them and the great spirit. And if, if being truthful and honest in this sharing and this giving, we brought honor to ourselves. And you see, there is no way we could cheat. There is no way we could cheat because the great spirit is everywhere. A and you see, when the great spirit is everywhere, <coughs> he knows when I try to cheat. And so if I try to share or to give something in, in, in the context of, uh, let us say, winning points, it would be better off if I had not lived in the first place than to try to do that. And that soon catches up with you. And you know, the, the, the Sioux have a word that, uh, uh, about people who, who go around and try to take advantage of this kind of sharing. For example, if I go over to your house to visit because I'm hungry and I know that you have food and I know that because of this sharing value that we have in our culture and our society that you are going to share with me, this word is called tioli. And it's, uh, you know that word? And it's a bad word, you know, and I shouldn't use it. But uh, we have these kinds of things. We recognize these kinds of things. And, and, you know, we can't cheat. We cannot do these things. And so it was that this value system gave way to that kind of way of life where I've got to know and respect you for being the person that you are, not whether you are male or female, or not because you are a boy or a girl, or because you are an old one, but because of the person you are. 
the kind of person you are, not what sex you happen to be or what <laughs> age you have to be. That has absolutely nothing to do with it, whatever. And so it was that we recognized these things a long, long time ago. And if you would but listen to us and to our people, we could teach you a lot of things like this, you know? A and in my years uh, in the newspaper business, I used to cover court sessions quite often. And I myself have sat in that court and heard learned judges say to our people who are standing before them, you know, like this, with their hands behind their back and their eyes downcast, what's wrong with you? Can't you look me in the eye? Look me in the eye. I've heard them say that on many an occasion. You see, and what it does is just exhibits the, the lack of knowledge that those learned judges have about our people. So it is with sociologists and history teachers, and, and I don't uh, mean to point my finger at any one person, but I'm talking about groups here, and, and anthropologists and archeologists who have come in prior years out to our, our lands and to our people and, and have started to, to um, this is not meant as a pun, to dig in, uh, uh, well, maybe it was, uh, uh, into our past and just obliterate the feelings of our people. You see, we know in the school context that the Bureau of Indian Affairs has failed in its educational program. And we know that our kids coming out of those BIA schools because of the tests which have been performed are weak academically. And we can predict how they are going to behave when they come to such places as the University of North Dakota or in your case, this school here. Our university students are going to move into that classroom and they are going to sit way back there in the back row and they are not going to say anything. When that instructor up in front starts doing his thing and that instructor is an expert, else he wouldn't have been hired. And through the course of his years of development to that position of expert, he has come to the point where he's developed certain techniques in getting his class going. And so he's up in front pacing around using these, these kinds of things. Meanwhile, he's watching everybody very carefully to see their reaction, to see what he's doing to get them turned on. And when he asks the question, he notice, notices very specifically that that Indian kid sitting back there in the back row doesn't lift up his hand and volunteer. Because you see, there's no way he's going to volunteer. That is to say, well, look at me. I'm better than you are because I know that answer and you don't, or I know that answer before you did, and that makes me better than you. And there is no way our kids, raised in the old tradition on the reservation, are going to behave in that way. We have to wait and let the old ones speak first. And you know, I have a, an interest in history, and so, I, I do a lot of digging into history. And I got the story of the original, the first battle at Wounded Knee quite some years ago from an old lady who survived that battle as a 13-year-old girl. But because I couldn't come into her house and say, Grandmother, tell me about the Battle of Wounded Knee, I had to wait until she introduced the subject. So I cannot tell you how many gallons of coffee I drank as I went back to her house night after night after night, waiting until she introduced the subject so I could start talking about what is called the battle at Wounded Knee. And you take this attitude of sharing and of giving, of self and of person, the attitude that I am not better than anybody else, but that nobody else is better than me, and that I cannot hold myself up as being better than someone else, has all carried over to this day. So that we remain, we were and we are, a different kind of people. But you see, we are going to maintain our identities. When Lewis and Clark made their famous journey 
1804, they crossed in what is today South Dakota on the evening of August 22nd. And they spent that night on what is today called Elks Point. And as they, the next day, beat their way up the river, eventually they crossed where the James River comes into the Missouri. And it was at that point that a, Yankton, a young Yankton Sioux boy of 17 years of age swam out to the middle of the river to intercept their little flotilla of, 70, of seven boats. And they took him on board and talked with him through um, their interpreter. A and the reason they were willing to take him on board and talk to him is because they had their instructions from President Jefferson to meet with the American Indian people along the way, to get to know them, to f learn about their languages, find out how many there were of them, and to impress, oh, learn about the native flora and fauna too, and to impress upon them the growing might of the United States. And so they arranged a meeting with this Yankton Sioux group and talked with them. And from their studies, they crossed into what is now North Dakota on October 17th of that year. But from their studies, we have got to determine there were roughly about 50,000 Sioux living at that time. Now, that we don't know that that's accurate, but give or take two or 3,000 in, in either direction, that's the only thing we have, that estimate. Well, in 1823, our people were stricken by smallpox. Again, in 1837, they were hit, hit again. Prior to this time, there was uh, one epidemic in 1799. Well, barely, you, you see, had one generation recovered from this thing, then the next generation was struck. So that today, almost all Sioux are, are immune to smallpox. I myself am. When I was in the service, you know, I always had to get two of those dumb vaccinations because they, the good army doctors always thought the first one was a bad uh, dosage or something, you know, and they'd always give it to me over again. I'd tell them, now listen, uh, you know, but they wouldn't listen to me at all. And so I always had two, and I just finally resigned myself to it and, and accepted that. In 1850, our people were stricken by uh, um, cholera. And from alcoholism, tuberculosis, chickenpox, smallpox, and all of these other things continued warfare with the white man's army and with other Indian groups by uh, 1850, where there were in round numbers 25,000 by official Bureau of Indian Affairs count. By 1890, there were 12,000. By 1900, there were 10,000. We were literally and figuratively a dying race. But it was about in 1900 when we finally began to hold our own, and we finally began to end that downward trend <coughs> as we were that dying race, and we began to level it off and hold our own, and very gradually began to grow back up. And today, today we are almost back to where we were when Lewis and Clark first met our people in 1804 because we number, our people, the Sioux, number about 47,000 people. We're almost there, you see? We haven't died and we haven't gone away. And now, I want to close. I was talking with Ellison just before this meeting and I told her I didn't, hadn't written a speech, and I haven't. But I want to close with something I did write. And this thing is copyrighted. It was written for an operetta that was presented at the University of North Dakota a couple years ago. And it takes 12 minutes. I know, because it had to be timed with the music, and I wrote it. And the ver I start out with a quotation from James Mooney, The Ghost Dance Religion and Sioux Outbreak of 1890, published by the Bureau of Ethnology. And I want to read this to you, and I, with that, I will quit. What tribe or people has not had its golden age? Before Pandora's box was loosed, when women were nymphs and dryads, and men were gods, and heroes, and when the race lies crushed and groaning beneath an alien yoke, how natural is the dream of a redeemer? And Arthur, who shall return from exile 
or awake from some long sleep to drive out the usurper and win back for his people that which they have lost. The hope becomes a faith, and the faith becomes a creed of priests and prophets until the hero is a god and the dream a religion looking to some great miracle of nature for its culmination and its accomplishment, unquote. And Sitting Bull said it this way, if the great spirit had desired me to be a white man, he would have made me so in the first place. He put in your hearts certain wishes and plans. In my heart, he put other and different desires. Each man is good in his sight. It is not necessary for eagles to be crows. Now as for me, I have seen the sunrise in all of its majesty bathe the plains in deep violets, burning vermilions and fiery oranges. I stand and I face to the sun and I lift my arms to the heavens in surrender to the exaltation that wells up inside of me. When the white man came, we welcomed him with open arms to our shores. Our credo called on us to share with him that which was ours. The great spirit is in you and in me. He exists in the plants, the skies, the mountains, and the waters. He is in the four-legged. He is in the two-legged. He is the earth. Thus it is that no one person owned the land. We all owned the land, and we shared this bounty and of ourselves with the newcomers. Their way of life and ours did not meet. We believed a man's word was truth. They practiced bargaining and sharp business deals. The colonies were a little white island surrounded by a Red Sea called Indian by your explorers. We could have rubbed you out, but we didn't. We brought to you your first Thanksgiving, and you were hungry for our land. You won through diplomatic trickery, through treaties which said one thing at the Peace Council, but another thing when enacted. Your people pushed ever westward, <coughs> frantically searching for gold or land to satisfy your material selfishness, and our game was destroyed. With our lands stolen from us and our food supply wantonly wiped out, our way of life was ended through diseases to which we had built no racial immunity as you had done over the thousands of years. Our peoples died like flies from plagues of smallpox and chickenpox and tuberculosis. You called us wards of the government and you put us on out of the way places called reservations. And finally, you took the ultimate step. You forbade us our religion. In the sacred circle, we prayed through the four cardinal directions and through Mother Earth to the Great Spirit. We said the Great Spirit was all-powerful and infinite. You did not understand our rituals, and you called us 
heathens. You outlawed our council, and we could no longer elect our chiefs. Our women voted, and our youth voted, but it was all gone and past. Our way of life was gone, and we were, we were supposed to become as white men, red-skinned white men. You called this assimilation. Before this, we were healthy and strong. The men stood tall and mighty, the protector of their old ones, their women, and their children. A people's worth is measured in the goodness of its women. Our women were good. They were mothers of the people. We were strong of spirit and of body. As our religion and our way of life flourished, so grew our little ones. Now with our game gone, our religion forbidden, and our government <coughs> destroyed, we were a lost people. We were both literally and figuratively a dying race. We survived only because of that inner spiritual strength and pride given to us by our forefathers. We didn't give up. We didn't give up. When your agents and your people floated our babies down rivers on chunks of ice to their certain deaths, we fought back. When Custer killed women and children at the Washita, we fought back. When a soldier crushed the tiny skulls of two babies with the butt of his rifle at the Kildeer Mountains, we fought back. When bayonets ripped open the bellies of our women pregnant with the future, we fought back. When heavy boots stomped our old ones to death, we fought back. When we won, you called it a massacre. When, when you won, you called it a battle. Custer massacred. Your headlines blazoned the words across the country. You did not realize it, but the Battle of the Washita was avenged. It was our last great battle on the field of war, for the massacre, massacre of Wounded Knee was symbolic of your view of our people. Eighteen babies still sucking at their mother's breasts were bayoneted or clubbed to death that terrible, dreary day. It's easy to remember, for 18 members of the 7th Cavalry received Congressional Medals of Honor for their actions during the gory slaughter of our babies and of our women. Red Cloud, Bull Bear, Pawnee Killer, Fire Thunder, and Crazy Horse, Big Road and Gaul, Crow King, and Sitting Bull. The names ring out as they told the bell of freedom for us today. Though they are dead, they live on in the legacy they have given to us. Our way of life was dead, but our values lived on. You could not destroy that inner pride and that spirit. These have sustained us and kept our race alive when everything you did would have obliterated a race of man. We have lived and we have grown because we are not afraid to die. Death is merely a veil which cloaks the entry to a better life. We not only survived the historical adversity brought by what you called manifest destiny, we have grown. We lived and we grew. We were different from you when Columbus walked on these shores, and we remain different to this day. It is not necessary for eagles to be crows, and today we are coming back. We have lived through the policies of extermination, of assimilation, and of termination. Extermination is dead. Assimilation is dead. Termination is dead. And now we live in another era set by your white man's government called self-determination, always 
packages and labels and deals, but we shall be ourselves with our own pride, with our own strengths, and with our own values. We shall survive as Sioux and Cheyenne, as Navajo and as Apache, as, as Cherokee and Oneida, as Kiowa and Choctaw. For ours is a way of life that speaks to things eternal. And our children, too, shall see their own sunrise. They, too, shall walk to their own hill, face to their sun, and lift their arms exultantly to the Great Spirit. And the Great Spirit shall cause the sunrise to shine in their hearts for all time, for today is a good day to die. Because, you see, if you live right, if you live according to the precepts of our people and give and share of yourself and live of these values, not only on that day when Marie Sandoz wrote about June 26, 1875, about the Battle of the Little Bighorn, that uh, crazy horse was saying, come on, it's a good day to die. That was a good day to die. But today, April 11, 1975, is also a good day to die. And that's why we live, and that's why we grow, and that's why we're going to continue to grow. Because we do not have the fear that the Christian world has put into everybody else. Because today, for us, is a good day to die. And now, let me tell you this. A couple of years ago, my wife and I were attending a, a, a uh, conference at West Palm Beach, Florida. And one night we went out on the beach, you see, and we were, the surf was coming in with a mighty and a tremendous roar. And uh, we sat there on the surf and I couldn't help but feel how powerful, how infinitely strong and mighty was that surf. And how I, as compared to it, was so tiny and so small. And I had to ask myself, is that surf, that water coming in, those tons upon tons of mighty water, is, is, is that the Great Spirit? And I had to say yes to myself. I had to say yes it is. And then I looked up in the sky and the, sky, the stars were shining so brightly and I saw the Milky Way moving across the sky sort of to the northeast and, and I had to think to myself, you know, Earth is just one tiny little pinpoint of a star in that galaxy which we call the Milky Way and you could take the entire Milky Way and put it all into the cup of the Big Dipper with room to spare. That's how small we are. And then if you see this galaxy, there are other galaxies over there, and beyond that there are quasars, on into the infinity of space and time. And I had to ask myself in relationship to this space and time and the land we were sitting on, is this infinity? Is this the Great Spirit? And I had to say yes. So I had to turn it around and come back the other way, from those quasars, to those galaxies, to the Milky Way, to Earth, and to see how tiny <coughs> Earth really is. And yet you take that tiny little ball like that that we call Earth and put me on it as a person and look how infinitely small I am. There could be billions of me upon a pinhead in that relationship. And so if we are that small, what is it then really that makes us what we are? What is it that saves us, that makes all of this worthwhile? You see, it's because the Great Spirit is in everywhere <coughs> and in everything, and you in you and in me. And that's why on April 11th, 1975, today is a good day to die.